Hello, everyone. This is Calla Winchell. Um, I'm an editor at Midwestern Marks. Um, this is our series, uh, Socialism on Your Ballot, where we discuss socialist or communist candidates that are running throughout the US. Um, today, we have Jose Cortez, who is running for the 51st District of California um, for the House of Representatives. Um, welcome, Jose. We're delighted to have you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk about socialism. Yeah, we're gonna have a good a good talk. And that's where the real Marxism is, is in the, the discourse. Um, great, well, I think we could just slide into the first question, which is one that we ask everyone. Um, I think simply because for most people, you're not born into being a Marxist, right? Like there's an origin or a journey to getting there. Um, so my first question is, what initially made you a socialist? What drew you to socialism? Um, and if there were any, what thinkers or community organizers were sort of particularly influential to you? Yeah, that's a great question because like you pointed out, most people just don't, you know, um, self-identify as like a Marxist or a socialist of any kind, just like right. because of how we're conditioned in this society and, and, and what we're told about socialism. But I, you know, a lot of us like are very socialistic. And I think that, you know, that in part of myself was really connected to socialists that actually met out in the street doing work. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, come into socialism through the idea of itself because when I went to school, obviously what I learned about socialism was not very positive. Right, Even when I was in college, socialism, when I when it was brought up, was uh, uh, an idea that was like, well, it's a good idea, but, you know, honestly, it doesn't work because right. insert liberal argument about human nature here or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it was when I actually met socialists in the street of a police brutality uprising in my hometown of El Cajon. Um, this was back in 2016. That's what made me an actual socialist because I connected the dots and, and they helped me connect the dots of, oh, everything that I've in inherently felt within myself, that it's wrong for people to be dying of preventable illnesses, right. well, you know, that there's, it's wrong for people to be homeless, homeless when there's more empty houses than there are homeless people, yeah. you know, that we're spending more on war that, while people like my mother and sister have to struggle in their public school systems, teaching kids with less and less resources. I mean, all of those inherent feelings that I had were able to be connected uh, once I actually yeah. met socialists and learned what socialism was, and that's an economic system meant on like meeting people's needs and not just the, the, the pocketbooks of a few, you know, really privileged elites. And, uh, you know, that's what made me a socialist. It wasn't even necessarily the idea. It was the application of the idea with the very thing that I felt intrinsically with myself and connecting it to a, a very real, beautiful history of yeah. working class people and, and, and just people all over the world fighting against imperialism and, and oppression. So yeah, like that's ultimately my origins are, you know, in a parking lot, in the, in the parking lot of my dentist's office, to be honest, where I used to go as a child during a police brutality uprising, having, you know, people come up and talk to me, uh, which oh. it can probably be very intimidating to walk up in the dark and talk to someone who looks like myself, you know, in the middle of like, in the middle of the night. But socialists were those people. And that's what made me a socialist was that right. commitment and that kind of willingness to do that work. Yeah, I think that personal interaction is so key. I know, I don't think I've turned anyone into a communist via um, arguments on the internet, but I've absolutely changed people's mind about leftism person to person, right? So I think that there's just that you can't replicate um, that discussion between two people. Um, and I definitely think there's a difference between reading theory or you know understanding conceptually some of these um, sort of historical terms and then that lived experience of really processing capital but then not connecting all the dots right and once those dots are connected um I, so many things start making sense there's so much cohesion um so that's interesting to me um the police brutality uh protest that you said it was in 2016 yep. um what uh from there, from those sort of initial meetings of socialists, um, what was the progression you experienced? And as far as your thinking and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a great, it's a great question. I love talking about this because I feel like it, it can so easily be related to by a lot of people, especially people that look like myself and other kind of oppressed groups of people in this country uh, living under like, you know, the imperialist government of the United States right. is that like what do you when you when you're when you want to get activated when you want to be political what are what kind of options are out there in the in the American left at this time so right. I when I first met socialists I was like well these are really good people they seem like really nice but I don't really know if like I had 
if I'm down, if I'm ready for like a full on like political party, I was kind of, you know, in a, in a place that I think a lot of people are, which is this kind of, you know, just what's what I'm thinking of highly individualized, like all we really <laughs> need is like people taking action, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, coming together around like these ideas, but not necessarily like with any sort of organization, right. uh, a lot of these like liberal ideas of uh, of you know that just revolution will spontaneously happen basically when right. just the masses have had enough which you know uprisings and, and and a lot of community power does demonstrate itself in those moments of like heightened contradiction but it was really like myself really trying to organize in a model that was not a socialist model right it was just mm -hmm. me trying to do like very much the grassroots anti-authority organizing mm -hmm. and seeing really that like wow it's like I'm very limited because even myself fighting with like a, a half dozen or a dozen of like my my best friends working together like for, you yeah. know thinking that we're doing the best that we can we're not you know capable of ourselves toppling a state right like this is a massive on the streets of that police brutality uprising they brought out every police department in the county of san diego we had tanks from san marcos all the way down to like you know, the SDPD, the alcohol police department, the sheriff's department. And I saw very clearly that we were facing an, you know, entrenched system of, you know, billions, trillions of dollars of, you know, millions of people of, of, lot, of a lot of really structural issues. Right. And our response as a community, as a class that I would, you know, soon learn, you know, the distinguishing factor of like what class versus community, I guess, in itself is, is, uh, is really what kind of made me a socialist. Because when I first got politically active, I was not a socialist. I met socialists and over the course of basically testing out these ideas in the street of like, okay, well, let's try out the anarchist model. And it's like, okay, oh, well, you know, that's that's cool if I want to, you know, engage in some like little rascal tactics or whatever. And no shame to, you know, the good anarchists that I know that are hardworking people that do a lot of work. But I was like, well, this is not a sustainable model in my mind for like how my communities and the people that look like me and the people I know are right. going to actually come to like a, like to gather around to, to believe as a governable uh, state and uh you know it became more and more clear to me that the only you know road to liberation that i could see forward for myself and for people that look like me and the people i care about was through a you know through a, like a marxist leninist model one yeah. that like definitely has you know a track record of liberating billions of people at this point right it has a proven track record yeah so it was almost like a process of elimination where you sort of applied the theory and, and saw what worked. Um, oh, yeah. I definitely think a lot of leftists can relate to that. There's moments in your life where the violence that was before implied or structural suddenly becomes visible. I think for a lot of people, it was in actually seeing how militarized the police is or police are or things like that. Um, I was in Baltimore in 2015 during the Freddie Gray uprising where we had curfews, where tanks rolled through the streets, you know, and it was, um, I'd had theoretical understandings of how racialized capital was and those sorts of things, but seeing it literally embodied um, is just a whole different experience and it really sort of brings the reality um, to the forefront. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's the story of a lot of leftists and especially the idea of applying and seeing what works. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a good um, methodology. And I'm, I'm glad that it led you to Marxist Leninism because you're right. I think it has a proven track record um, and it can again. So that's great. Um, I think let's talk a little bit about your district and the specific areas that are facing your community um, in San Diego. And um, if you see many parallels between your community and the wider um, US as far as um, issues that they share. Oh yeah, definitely. So in the 51st uh, district, which makes up most of Eastern San Diego, like the city limits of San Diego, all the way through, you know, the parts of East County that may, are known as El Cajon, La Mesa, Lemon Grove, all the way up North to uh, basically this huge air base called Miramar. There's a, you know, a, a lot of really just unifying conditions that are uh, really, really impacting a lot of working class people, such as housing, mm -hmm. you know, housing, I think, is one that can be connected also to the just in experience of people nationwide right now. Uh, yeah. You have uh, rents that are increasing on average, like all over the county at 20%. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, you know, people who are facing 60 day uh, notices to vacate. 
uh, because landlords want to, you know, renovate the property and jack up the rent even more. Yeah. Uh, they see it as like a market that they can profit off of even more and more. And they see this as like a great opportunity for them, uh, which, you know, for working class people is the middle of a pandemic when lots of people, you know, especially, especially, you know, uh, you know, people who historically have been like pushed into domestic labor have just been like forced out of the workplace who have been, who are now mm -hmm. like experiencing a lot of uh you know insecurity like just because of this uh, pandemic you know you can kind of see the two sides of the coin for us it's like some of the worst times of our lives right now but for the ruling class and for these landlords it's like oh it's a great opportunity to make more money in another yeah. you know just great year for them in the stock market so housing is definitely one of the biggest ones that uh, people in the district are experiencing and one that we you know talk about a lot we you know are arguing for and uh, basically organizing around a constitutional amendment guaranteeing housing for all people uh yeah. because our argument for a lot of these things on our uh, campaign points is you know they talk about life liberty and the pursuit of, pursuit of happiness but what does that any any of that mean if yeah. you're hungry or if you don't have housing or if you don't have access to dignified health care uh including um you know mental health and reproductive health care so yeah. Uh, you know, for especially housing, that's a huge one. Uh, another one that uh, oftentimes we'll talk about is uh, the anti-war movement and anti-imperialist movement uh, here. Mm -hmm. San Diego is a huge military city. For those who don't mm -hmm. know, it's the home of the Pacific Fleet, uh, which, Lucky you know, me. has a long, long history of doing all sorts of terrible things to just, you know, expand access to capital for that's U.S. Amazing. businesses and yeah. multinational corporations. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we're, we, we do and, and, and honestly talking to a lot of people is just like, well, the money, when everyone complains about well, like, well, you know, immigrants or whoever's taking money from us, it's like, well, you know, what about the military industrial complex here in San Diego that's, you know, are, you know, taking up prime Bayfront real estate that, you know, that's shamelessly polluting our communities like they've done in Barrio Logan for years with like their, with the shipyards and the docks and, and, and the, and the junk. And the junkyards that they've just like you know populated in the community and just let like um you know grow grow so mm -hmm. i mean a lot of what we're talking about is you know the three you know basically our five major uh campaign points housing health care an end to the endless wars basically the defunding and demilitarization of the police and and the jailing of all killer cops yeah. and you know fighting the the war that's you know currently being waged on immigrants and migrants uh in this country so when we knock on doors those are a lot of the issues that we've been you know hearing from people and that's why we made them the five points in our uh, in our platform and i think they relate very well to a lot of people nationwide uh because they you know there's you know i guarantee not just the uh, military bases in san diego there's not just ice raids you know in our workplaces and in our homes and our communities uh just here in san diego there's not just people living on the streets and being forced out of their homes here in san diego uh, these are issues that are, you know, impacting workers all over the country. Yeah. Um, I think that's spot on. Um, one thing I really admired about the analysis that you've offered um, on your website, which I'd encourage people to check out, um, is the way that you view these issues as interconnected. Um, I think that is relatively unique in the two-party system we operate under generally, which um, tends to resist um, critiques that look at systems of power and instead want to sort of silo off issues. So there's environmentalism, but that's separate from fiscal policy, which is separate from this and that. Um, and I think your campaign does a great job in a lot of different instances of showing how um, truly entwined um, these issues are. Um, so I, I think a great point is uh, tackling U.S. immigration demands attacking of U.S. imperialism, right? Like you, oh, can't, you can't um, turn on a sink with one hand and then cry that water is getting everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And we create the problem and then cry at the results um, while treating the victims grotesquely. Just there's no other word. Yep. Um, and so I think that that's really key. And one reason we need more leftist candidates is to sort of start pointing out that these systems of power mutually reinforce. Right, the Pentagon is also one of the worst environmental polluters. So if oh, you're definitely. an environmentalist, you want to audit the Pentagon. You want to cut that budget and get that money literally anywhere else. Um, and so I think that's really essential for leftist candidates. And it's something that I'm glad that um, you're bringing to your own campaign because we can't tackle these issues if we look at them as individuals. We've talked about the problem of individualism, um, thinking of yourself as a political unit, right? 
Um, but it also becomes a problem when you look at um, sort of segments of issues instead of the total issue. Oh, um, definitely. So I, I really appreciate that analysis um, that you're bringing. Um, speaking of the two party system, which we have to talk a little bit about, um, there are some leftists or socialist leaning people in the US who will argue that the Democratic Party is um, reformable and couldn't eventually maybe be dominated by the um, the left saviors of, you know, Bernie and AOC and those sorts of people. Um, I think that argument's dying down a little bit, but um, how would you respond to, um, to that critique? How does your run with uh, PSL challenge that? And um, how important do you think it is to have a working class movement specifically um, as an alternative to the Democratic Party? Oh yeah, I mean, these are great questions and ones that we get you know, approached with all the time, to be honest, because there's a yeah. lot of people that come up and approach us and they say, well, why don't you just run as a Democrat? Because you'll have more access and you can reform, you can change the party from the inside. Home reduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the reality is they don't understand how fundamental and how connected to this capitalist system and just dependent on it, the Democratic Party is. The idea that it'll change itself or you can change it when at its very roots are like founded in exploitation. And I mean, it was the party of, of segregation and it was the party of like, you know, if all of this terrible stuff and the belief system that people can change it from the inside flies, you know, very or stands very starkly in the face of the reality of the Democratic Party, the machine that exists within it, that's that ruthlessly crushes any sort of uh, dissent that goes out and basically just uh, rewrites the rules at will as a way yeah. of uh, maintaining control in the hands of a very small corporate elite class and uh, and their political lackeys and, and lobbyists. So, I mean, the, I guess my argument to these people, the people that bring up this critique, which is, you know, pretty frequent, uh, yeah. is... The logic that I would use with with uh, you know when I worked with children uh, uh, when I worked in a classroom, which was if I was like controlling the game of Monopoly and just basically being the bank and doing whatever I wanted, the little kids even at a certain point would be like, "I'm done with this rigged game. I'm gonna go play a different <laughs> game. I'm gonna play one where I actually stand a chance of winning, where I actually like have my own interest instead of just like expecting uh, you know to for a different result." I mean, I think it was Albert Einstein who said that. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna horribly paraphrase Albert Einstein. But to expect different results from from a well established process, right, is nice. isn't science. It's uh, it's lunacy, basically. And yeah. so, for me, uh, it's very much uh, tying it back to you know there isn't any sort of reason to believe the Democratic Party. Just if you look at where how they're funded, how they operate, but even just like at the actual material history of what they've right. done, there's absolutely no history there to support that they are suddenly and just uh, out of nowhere going to take this. Uh, 180 degree turn even if a large what we saw in 2020 for example where millions of people are taking the streets in, in mm -hmm. california which has a democratic supermajority in all levels of government yeah. right well i mean if the argument was going to be made that all it really takes is millions of people expressing themselves to these supposedly right. ignorant democrats <laughs> who just didn't know any better while they're having fancy meals and sending mm -hmm. their kids to private schools with the same people whose corporations are poisoning our communities and stealing our water and doing all these other kinds of just terrible things to us, you know, obviously that stands very, very, you know, directly in, in contrast to that. Uh, Cause we can see it's like, oh, even when they are hearing our voices, what are they doing in these democratic strongholds? They're mobilizing militarized police. They're right. tear gassing groups of people that are peacefully protesting. They're doing everything in, in, in their power to maintain control. And the, our response as the party for socialism and liberation uh, and, you know, as the, the Peace and Freedom Party, who I'm running under uh, here in, in California, the only mm -hmm. socialist party in the state of California uh, that has ballot access. Um, so, you know, our whole position is that like in, in, the, in the face of such just overwhelming evidence that they'll never be on our side, we need a real working class party that is accountable not to a billionaire elite of, you know, just, you know, these people who have never had to work a day in their lives, essentially. We need to be accountable and relatable to, to our people, working class people and a party that is actually made up and owned by them. So the Peace and Freedom Party, which has hundreds of thousands of registered voters here in California, that's, you know, growing, that's running campaigns like my own, you yeah. know, is, is here to basically show that not only is it possible, even in this uphill kind of just rigged situation that the Democrats, you know, uh, and the Republicans try to put out for third parties like ourselves, uh, that our ultimate goal isn't only just to like run a campaign of equity with these like warmongers and these <laughs> no, absolute no. shams of real democracy, 
but to like call out their contradictions and use the platform that it presents yeah. to show that it's like, well, they tell us that politics is something that only they can engage with at their level and under their terms. When in reality, it's like, no, politics is basically the application of force of one class against another, right? Like in, yeah. at the end of the day. And our class just needs to be more organized. We're not outnumbered, we're out organized at this point, like Malcolm X said, right? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. There's such a, just such a belief that one day they'll be members of this upper class. And so it just destroys class solidarity. Um, I think it's a John Steinbeck quote. I won't turn you into the paraphrasing police if you don't turn me in, we're, we're defunding those two. Um, <laughs> but it's something like uh, John Steinbeck says, um, the reason that socialism never took root in America is because the poor view themselves as embarrassed millionaires. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. And until we can sort of get people to recognize um, class solidarity or have them recognize it themselves through pointing out the contradictions, um, it is a bit of an uphill battle. But I think it's important to provide an alternative um, because it is our job to point out the contradictions. I know um, returning to the issue of housing, um, on your website, you talk about that, how there's a really extreme contradiction when you see empty homes and people without houses, right? I mean, it really highlights that homelessness is a choice. Like it's something we allow to happen. Um, I think on your website, it said, there's 57,000 empty homes in San Diego and about 5,000 unhoused people. Um, something like that. So basically, if we gave everyone a house, there would be 52,000 empty homes still. It would make not a right. deal, any difference. Um, but the point is not that. The point is the violence that's implied um, with homelessness. If we remove that threat, um, landlords lose their negotiating power. So I think those kinds of contradictions are where you can we can start getting people to look at things more critically, right? Because that is something that makes no sense. Um, but until you actually see someone, like I, I um, lived in Chicago for a few years, there would be cases of unhoused people who would literally freeze to death outside of heated stores, yep. right? And that image just should not be allowed in a society. I mean, that it's grotesque, um, oh, but yeah. it happens all the time. And it's those kinds of contradictions that I think is our responsibility to point out. Um, oh, yeah. And I think your campaign is doing that, which is great. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, it's horrible, the conditions that people live in. My apologies, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. This is uh, your thing. You didn't interrupt at all. Keep going. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I was just gonna say, I hear it all, all at my job, too. I work in a call center taking calls from people who work, you know, full time, who are, mm -hmm. you know, people that are like, you know, even under the, the ruling class's own BS ideology or mythology that they've tried to create, are like doing what they're supposed to do, right? They're working, right. they're trying Following to- Following the rules. But they're living out of their cars. They're mm -hmm. like working. They, they're 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 struggling because they have a high deductible because their employer has a terrible medical plan. And yeah. and basically, I work in like an outsourced HR capacity and just see very clearly like how the fundamental failures of this system are impacting workers in, in ways of like housing and mm -hmm. how you know they really the most nefarious I would say the the most nefarious thing about this system is how it's instilled this sense of onus of, of ownership over the shame and, and of the, yeah. and the failures of the system in the individual mm -hmm. that it's the individual's fault for the systemic failure of uh, of, of of the society to like provide housing or health care or you know fundamental human dignity and that's something that you know our campaign you know has identified as the ment as the mental terrain that we're organizing in right is that mm -hmm. i'm talking to people in parking lots that are like sitting there after a 60 hour work week and are telling me like well you know like i work and i'm miserable and why shouldn't other people be miserable just to try and, and have a, a scrap of, of chance of maybe right. making it to like you know a, a, a standard of living that you know honestly should just be a guarantee in this country yeah. and you know that that mentality right can only be combated with revolutionary optimism and 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 a really determined group of people that have the vision to show that it doesn't we, we all know like we see the, like you mentioned the empty heated stores while people are freezing to death yeah. Seeing like, you know, here in San Diego, the example I would use is the amount of people that they're pulling out of Balboa Park, which is a major tourist attraction. People come all over right. and it's just beautiful. People are like, oh, look at all the Baroque inspired, you know, architecture. <laughs> architecture it's so beautiful. Yeah. We spent all this money because San Diego, but they're pulling bodies every day of homeless people out of that park that are unhoused, who are, who are dying of exposure. And, uh, you know, the kind of contrast of that is like, well, the only way that's going to end is if we like, 
you know, actually build a movement not only not, not only you know is ideologically prepared to win, but is you know confident, right? That feels that like warm, you know, burning revolutionary fire inside and believes that it's actually possible. Because the big thing in the American left right now, I think, is this kind of like fatalism of like, oh, you know, yeah. it's so horrible, but there's nothing we could do but be right and, and scream into an echo chamber <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, we'll be right as we um, ride off into the sunset or whatever. But right. uh, yeah, things are breaking down. Um, yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, it's it's a problem because I think fundamentally we have to overcome um, that truism of capitalist realism. There is no alternative. Um, that's what everyone is convinced of. There's no escape. And in a lot of ways, capitalism has really succeeded in restricting even the imagination. Like we cannot see beyond the structures that we live in. And that's why the sort of the phrase trite though it is, a better world is possible is so key because it's yeah. breaking through that drudgery that is fostered by 70 hour work weeks. Like those things are purposeful. There's a reason that they're working you so hard. It's not because that labor is necessary. Um, it is because it prevents class consciousness organizing and even just human flourishing. I think that's a pitch that I make a lot um, to people is that because <laughs> people hear communism or socialism and they picture brutalist architecture and um, <laughs> Russia in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union is typically right. what they picture. Perpetual um, gray. <laughs> right. And that's completely antithetical to it. For right. me, it is a philosophy that encourages uh, human flourishing, um, meeting the basic human needs, and then allowing everything else to grow. Because humans innately labor, we're innately curious. It's not like people would stop working. Right. Um, but yeah, I think that we need to break through that just um there is no alternative which is just right. such potent propaganda um oh, definitely and we're doing it you know like honestly like i said there's a lot of this like feeling of uh, of uh you know oh like you said like the the, the old tina what we would call it, right there's no alternative right yeah. but uh at the end of the day like when you go out into the streets you knock on doors and if you're like living the life of like an organizer of a revolutionary like there's people out here that are like hungry for it like one of the biggest yeah. things that we talk to when they're when, when we talk to people and what they're like looking for in like a in a revolutionary organization is like they're looking for community they're looking for a group of people that actually believe that there's a like you said like you said a better world possible and when you have that when you have like a a vision of like okay we're not just doing things like waiting running out the clock hoping that right. the world just right you know the ship writes itself it's like we're actually building our own ship and we're getting ready to like you know you know set it afloat and actually see if it floats and if it works that, that really like i think reaches a lot of people and I think that there's a lot of for our movement to be optimistic about is if we just go out and actually do it if we actually just yeah. have these conversations like I am you know embarrassed almost almost right about how much I'm outside of like a target or a grocery store just like talking to workers including the people like just like working on the on the clock that day uh about like how we can build a mass movement how we can do this stuff. and like I think I think a lot of people would think like well people aren't interested in that but I mean, I will tell you just right now that you will get a lot of people who want to who want to sign up, who yeah. come out. I've had people come out and be like, I'm actually very, very interested. Give me some information. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, housing is 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 an issue that is so unifying. Right. And to bring yeah. it back to like the campaign points, it's, you know, one that it, you don't have to be a socialist revolution. You don't have to have read every. If every chapter rent, of capital <laughs> yeah, <if laughs> you know? you've paid rent. You're on board, I think, like right. if you've ever made a landlord rich. You get it like right, right. exactly <laughs> live somewhere for 10 years and yet not own anything and then right. get thrown out like some of the people that we've talked to doing you know housing campaigns and fighting for rent control here in san in san diego and california so yeah you know it, it is definitely like the mental terrain by design is difficult right but not insurmountable the ruling class mm -hmm. think they're invincible right they've literally are off flying into space on rockets and shit yeah. wearing you know <laughs> cowboy hats excuse my language but mm -hmm. like you know, at the end of the day, uh, when the, you know, they, they are definitely not invincible. They are definitely very, very fallible. Yes. And what we saw in 2020 is that, yeah, we can, we can, we can catch them uh, very much slipping when they're not, when they're not uh, aware of it, if we just are organized and if we yes. come, you know, prepared. Yeah, I think um, one thing that the protests into 2020 had that, um, you know, I think like lots of leftists, I've been to lots of protests for years before, but 
there was something that was very particular about the 2020 um, protests where you could sort of see a world that was to come um, or, or something like that, that you could see the potential that was created, even though I think we've seen disappointingly that a lot of the promise of the 2020 protests has not been fulfilled, right? Police budgets are higher than ever. Right. Um, murders are still happening all the time. The LAPD is still full of gangs. Um, it, it's a nightmare, right? right. Um, but I think that that just showing the potency of those protests and especially decentralized protests, I hope people will carry that um, with them. Um, and that's yeah. sort of, yeah, part of demonstrating that optimism. It's proof of concept enacting, um, enacting the works. Because you're right, I think that most people do agree with sort of the principles. When you look at polling, um, 60 something percent people want a Medicare for all type system. You know, these kinds of things, they poll very well. If it was truly a representational government, we would have that by now. Right. Um, but we don't, and that's not a coincidence, but harnessing those people that are interested um, but just not interested enough to leave a democratic party or or whatever party um, is right. so hopefully that um, we're pulling that uh, pulling those people away with um, campaigns like yours. Oh, definitely. That's the goal. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, okay, let's see. Um, we've talked about electoralism, and um, you know, I, I think we've probably addressed that enough. There's some people feel that voting is given too much emphasis over other forms of organizing. But I think you've made it pretty clear that uh, your election goes hand in hand with your community organizing. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I think it's a great way to meet uh, millions of people, uh, you know, is, yeah. is, in, is through their already established political development or the consciousness that exists around, well, democracy means voting every two to four years mm -hmm. for what you believe in. And honestly, and I'm never I thinking do... about politics in, until it comes around again. Sorry. Right, right, right. That's that's the, 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 the but that's the kind of consciousness that a lot of people have is like, oh, mm -hmm. politics is something I do every two to four years, and then and then I don't think about it. But so to to ignore that and for me as a as a socialist that's trying to like get everybody right, not just like mm -hmm. a small group of people, but like as many people that that build the wealth, like people like my mom, people like my my family, people like my neighbors, you know, that I live around uh you know meeting them where they're at right means meeting them at the at the ballot box in certain cases because obviously we're we haven't stopped running our other campaigns for housing healthcare, and all these other kind of things out in the streets mm -hmm. but as far as you know you know why we engage in the electoralism i always just tell people it's like the alternative to me is just seeding them to reaction and these are people i care about these aren't people i've given up on right like these are yeah. people that like we have, I have hope that, cause I've seen like, if, if we just show them what socialism is, they'll support us. I mean, we have people like people's parents that are like people that you never would think that lived through the cold war that like, right. you know, were like conditioned to hate socialists, you know, uh, uh, who are like, you know what? Like I now seen that like socialists are just like my family members and people that, and you know, my neighbors who have helped me during the COVID pandemic, yeah. stuff like that, you know? So yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's, it is definitely, um, uh, you know, been a trip for sure. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly what meet people where they are, and yeah, I think that's a good way because you're right. I was convinced that it when I first uh, started researching and believing in socialism, gosh, she was probably ten years ago. I was like a little baby communist. Um, my parents were horrified. Even my family and friends were horrified, and you hear it all. And uh, most of those people I've pulled left enough that they identify as socialists now. I mean, it takes 10 years of arguing and <laughs> my dad screaming about the free market. But um, <laughs> you are able to reach people, right? Because it's, it's not actually um, these crazy positions. And I do think that there's something like the um, Bernie to other leftism pipeline that I've seen with a lot of leftists. And that is really the only utility I can see in... Um, the Democratic Party sort of lip service to left issues is you have people buy into those things and then they see the failure of the Democratic Party, but those issues still matter. They still bought into those issues. I think that's the opportunity we have to pull them to the left. Um, great, I think that was a good response for electoralism concerns. I think it, it just should be one tool. It's not the only tool, but it's a tool to use for sure. Oh yeah, I mean, I'll use as much ammunition as I can get to fight this system, and exactly. you know that's what I see these these you know these attempts for running electoral campaigns and 
and the you know the reforms that we fight for is it's just ammunition and more tools that we can use to help dismantle this system because of our the 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 less our people are struggling, the more they're going to be able to basically be a good revolutionaries. That's what we're hoping for. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about your foreign policy position, um, because I think it's unusual to see people talking so much about imperialism, even sometimes on the left, where I think there tends to be focus on community issues, which I think is legitimate. Um, but I, I'm interested in that because I, I know... Um, call for all into foreign wars, um, but you even mentioned sanctionings and things like that. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, hear a little bit about that um, from your perspective, what informed those positions um, and what's your vision of a better future for foreign policy? Oh yeah, I mean, as a child, I was horrified by just the propensity for war of the United States. Like why, why did we invade Iraq or Afghanistan or these other right. countries? I mean, here in Southern California, I grew up with a lot of people from Iraq and Syria and, you know, from countries targeted by U.S. imperialism and learning the history of the United States and, and its, you know, and its wars for profit mm -hmm. is definitely enough to, you know, make me start questioning, like, well, what what's really at play here? Is it just like the United States is trying to preserve democracy or is it actually like, you know, something else? Right. And seeing, you know, obviously the history of the U.S. military opening up uh, investment opportunities and, and basically the theft of natural resources. Yeah. yeah. Investment opportunities, which means like destroying infrastructure and, and we would call, you know, maybe war crimes, yeah. you could even say uh, confiscate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Just like the forcible <laughs> taking of property, but you know, like it definitely, uh, you know, was it something that really stood out in my mind as, as mm -hmm. even as a child. So when I met socialists, uh, you know, I met well, various, I met socialists, I met the PSL first, but I also met other socialists. And when I kind of learned about like the differences between the different socialist tendencies, uh, what really stood out to me about the PSL was their, you know, their stance on imperialism and how unflinching they were about defending the right of self-determination yeah. and national sovereignty. Because, you know, I feel, I felt, I've, I've noticed that it's very easy for people to like, for example, when the Hong Kong protests were happening for them, people to yeah. be like, oh, the evil Chinese government that, you know, I'm anti-police, so therefore, you know, which I'm also very much anti-police brutality. Anybody me too, who but... knows me will tell you that for sure. But, you know, like to equate, uh, you know, the situations, it just really showed like a very, you know, I don't want to call it like willfully racist, but just a very real like, yeah, this, like a very lack of understanding or a very like not disciplined perception of what it means to be an, an anti-imperialist. It's like, yeah. Oh, okay, so you'll stand in solidarity with uh, with non-white people in their quest for like sovereignty and national liberation until until it becomes difficult here right. with like people in the media and just like liberals, you know, yelling out about how China is the greatest evil. And then it you know it's really easy just to take the middle of the road path. It was like, well, I'm a socialist, but I don't stand with actual socialist countries. Yeah. So for me, the imperialism thing is super important, not only because of you know what it means to be a princi principal you know marxist in, in practice is being an anti-imperialist but because it fundamentally is like you know a huge polluter like we talked about it's a reason uh that you know so much goes left undone in our communities because we're spending a yeah. trillion plus dollars every year in these terrible you know power moves trying to like uh, dominate the entire globe uh, so yeah, I mean, imperialism is such an important issue that oftentimes gets given a back seat, yeah. uh, you know, here because you know we talk about bread and butter issues, you know, housing, healthcare, all those things are, are are important. But as you pointed out earlier, we can't talk about one without talking about the other. We can't talk about housing if we don't talk about about the war because a lot some of these people on the streets are homeless veterans. Some of the people that I was talking to in Tijuana are deported homeless veterans, you know, like right, right. there's intersections in these, in these struggles. And uh, the people that you were talking about earlier with immigration and, and migration, uh, people fleeing the US coups and wars and the theft of their resources. Uh, you know, there's people I've heard down here in San Diego mention this, and I think it's great, great wording. Uh, you know, people are just following their resources, right? People don't leave where their yeah. families are buried or where their homes are, where they're, where, you know, where, where they're, you know, where they've lived their whole lives just on a whim, they, they're they leaving because they have to follow what was taken from them. They're following, you know, including the people that were taken from them as well. So yeah, definitely imperialism is a major issue that we like to talk about because to us, it's fundamentally tied to every single one of the demands that we're 
are talking about. And also the United States owes reparations to these countries that we've pillaged, you know, senselessly. And no one, the, you know, whether it's the, the so-called squad or any of these other left Democrats has any sort of, you know, I don't know, political will to, to yeah. actually bring up these issues in a meaningful way beyond, you know, paying lip service to like, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, there's no real argument within the Democratic Party that we're seeing about about ending the endless wars. Right. So yeah, I mean, we definitely are going to be screeching it from the mountaintops uh, until <laughs> until there until the United States isn't occupying you know over a hundred other countries at this point. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think keeping that anti-imperialist um, focus is key to understanding, especially modern Marxism. I mean, there's a reason that the 30th chapter of uh, Capital, Volume 1, is on colonization, right? It is um, sort of that central thing. Lenin talks about it all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I think that even when um, we're just discussing what isn't being funded, right, um, like housing and those sorts of things, it's just that presence of all that money being spent that's sort of in the background. Um, and I mean, the Green New Deal does not mention the Pentagon once, even though it's one of the largest polluters in the planet. It's just that sort of oh, basic yeah. thing where they will fail us at every turn, even when it seems like they're allowed, you know, showing comprehensive plans. Um, there's just these big absences, right? You, you didn't even mention ugh, the Pentagon. And it just sort of, it, yeah, it belies their point. So I, I think right. that's great. We just have to keep emphasizing. I think it is one of those, imperialism is one of those issues that separates us. Um, greatly from other people, even when we talk about bread and butter um, issues. And so I right. hope I hope other leftists lean into that because it is something that distinguishes us from Democrats and Republicans who just want to talk about inflation oh, yeah. and things like that, which are serious but do not allow for a comp. A, it's a shallow analysis. We'll say that that's a different. Oh, definitely. Way to put it. <laughs> and one and one that's by design, you know, kind of yes. uplifted in the discourse a lot, you know, by the ruling class. Like they want us to view these issues of like immigration completely separate from the issue of imperialism, yeah. uh, because obviously if we start connecting these dots, if we connect the you know anti-war movement with the immigrant rights movement, with the you know with all these other kinds of movements, the housing rights movement. You know, then obviously you have a, a larger, more you know, determined militant group of people than you do yeah. if you just have uh, a group of people believing that immigration is an individual issue that can be addressed through individualized legislation right. or whatever, and not right. wh while not addressing capitalism, right? Yeah. So, you know, definitely uh, a struggle in a lot of these like more liberal spaces, uh, especially to to try and connect those dots. But all the more reason why socialists need to be included in the discourse to be fighting these ideological battles because we're not in the business of trying to just organize the left, right? It's like right. organizing the masses and the mm -hmm. masses are, I, I, just from my own experience, talking to them, going out, knocking on doors, they're in favor of doing what's in their best interest, not on this kind of just hyper personal or individualized right. kind of like a idea in a vacuum, right? They're, they, want, they want to not be forced to move every two years. They want to be mm -hmm. able to have dignified healthcare where they're not like stressing out about paying things. And being able to connect those dots in a way is like, oh yeah, well, this is how we do it rather than there's nothing we could do besides have the right positions and look down on everybody else. That's not us for having the right positions. Right, which you is know, fun of those to do, yields but results. not productive. Yeah, it's not right. productive at all. Um, even though you feel better than other people. I think everyone has that sort of period you go through and then you just realize that purity in and of itself is a problem. Like purity culture is just not serving us well. Um, it's not relatable to the masses, right? Like, no, I mean, don't, no. don't get me wrong, we have to be principled, but yeah, like you learn that. I learned that the hard way. You can't just yeah. like say whatever. You can't just like yell, read, Mar read Lenin at somebody. Right. And no. like the first time I heard the term democratic centralism was in the in the middle of a street, like direct action that we were doing. <laughs> and somebody was like, direct democratic centralism at me, like just as a like phrase, just conversationally. Yeah. And I was just like, I don't know what that is, but I don't like it, you know, yeah. at that point in my career. Cause like, I didn't know what like my political development at the time i was like i didn't know anything about social i didn't know who lenin was let alone right. like you know like what, what democratic centralism was he's so a big I mean, bad like, guy yeah it's not enough to just be right it's like how do you deliver that message and how do you yeah. like address workers people you know i think are still learning that in a lot of these spaces but i mean like i said i've seen a lot to be optimistic about yeah i, I think i think there's absolutely a lot to be optimistic about um it's mm -hmm. just about honing the strategies that work for us and those strategies that work in one place won't work in the material conditions of another. So it's also about, you know, flexibility, which I think um, your campaign is demonstrating. 
Um, final question. Um, how can people volunteer, donate, or find out more about your campaign? Uh, and where can they find you on social media? Yeah, so we're on all the social media stuff. We're on Instagram, Twitter, uh, just Cortez for Congress. Um, my last name is spelled with an S instead of a Z, but yeah. Cortez, the number four Congress. Uh, .org. That's our website. You can find basically all the information there. You can find our donation stuff for uh, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, all of that. We are very much a uh, grassroots, like community-led uh, kind of campaign. So I work in a, like I said, a call center. So obviously we're going to be, uh, you know, asking people to help if they can donate. Uh, they can get involved by volunteering also on that same web website. Uh, they can reach out on any of our social media platforms. Uh, or of course, they can go on to the PSL website, fill out an application. Uh, we definitely encourage that because at this stage, uh, you know, if I'm running for Congress, I've definitely learned that if I could do this, literally anybody watching this this program, anybody that that's like got a, a conscience that believe that that knows that the world doesn't have to be this way, you know, can also do this work. So just asking everybody who does want to get involved, please reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I don't know, carrier pigeon, throw, throw a, <laughs> you know, a bottle at our office. We'll be there and we'll answer your response. Uh, we're also doing a um, series on Instagram uh, every week. I believe at, uh, I think it's Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time uh, where we're going to be uh, talking about, you'll find more on Instagram, but we're just going to be basically doing a live stream, uh, just right. answering questions and engaging with the community on Instagram. So definitely encourage everybody to, engage with us there, you know, get involved here if you're in San Diego. We've got a lot of really exciting campaigns going on. And of course, if you can donate to basically the only socialist campaign here in uh, Southern California for the House of Representatives, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about socialism with you today. Well, thank you so much, Jose. This has been great. Um, what an interesting discussion and um, absolutely best of luck to you in your election, in your community engagement and all of that stuff. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.